Hello and welcome to the National Oceanography Centre Open Day. I'm Dr. Alejandra sanchez Franks, And I'm Dr. Ben Mote. We are going to talk about climate change, the role of the oceans in our changing climate, how we observe the ocean, and the consequences of climate change for our ocean and what we can do to reduce the impact. As sunlight reaches the Earth, some energy is reflected back into space. Some energy is absorbed and re-radiated as heat, but most of the heat is absorbed by greenhouse gases and then re-radiated in all directions, warming the Earth. The effect is like wrapping a blanket around the planet. There has been a dramatic change in the temperature of the Earth in the last 2,000 years. Before 1850, temperature reconstructions from ice cores and tree rings show that the Earth was about 0.2 degrees warmer than the temperature in 1850. After 1850, the observations show that the temperature has risen by 1.2 degrees. To explore if this is down to human activity or the planet's natural cycles, we can use mathematical models of the ocean, land and atmosphere system. The black line is the observed temperature since 1850. The green line is only the natural solar and volcanic forcing, so not influenced uh, by us. You can see that this is very different to the observations which are in black line. The simulation including both human and natural forcing agree well with the observed temperature, suggesting it is caused by us. Some ocean facts for you. The ocean covers 71% of the planet's surface. It produces 50% of the oxygen we breathe through photosynthesis. It is absorbing 25% of the excess atmospheric carbon dioxide and 93% of the excess heat. We are an island nation and 95% of the UK's imports and exports arrive by ship. We get energy supplies from the ocean, from wind and wave power, and 97% of the Earth's water is held in the ocean. We also depend upon the ocean for food, so a healthy ocean is very important. Ocean currents play a big role in regulating our climate. Warm water is taken polewards from the equators towards the colder regions. These cooler currents return back to the equator and we call these ocean gyres. The ocean is continuously moving. This mathematical simulation of the ocean around Antarctica really shows this. As the winds blow continuously around Antarctica, it drives these currents. You can see these eddies formed here and there are lots of filaments. Between South America and Antarctica, there's over 135 million cubic meters of water per second going through that narrow gap. And interestingly, here at the bottom of South Africa, you see these large eddies that come up into the South Atlantic. These transport warm salty waters from the Indian Ocean and take it into the South Atlantic. So now let's go on to think about larger ocean circulation. In the Atlantic, we have these warm salty surface waters that head northwards and come up towards Iceland and Greenland. As they move northwards in the Atlantic, that warm water loses some of its heat to the atmosphere and there's also evaporation, so it gets a little bit saltier. When it gets off Iceland and Greenland, it is denser than the water around it and it sinks down to the deep oceans and returns as a pathway that circles around Antarctica and then comes back up again in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Water that goes along this pathway can take up to a thousand years to complete a full circuit. It doesn't just move the water around, it also moves heat and carbon into the deep ocean and stores it away. We have been observing the strength of the circulation since 2004 in the North Atlantic from direct observations. Between Africa and the Bahamas, we have found that the amount of heat transported is the same as 1 million power stations. There is an ocean observing system for scientists to determine the changes in the ocean and climate. We need to be consistently and constantly measuring the ocean. There are many ways we do this. Ships allow us to do multidisciplinary research expeditions, ocean robots which operate autonomously, satellites that measure the ocean surface remotely, and finally vehicles that can survey the ocean floor. The NSC runs two research ships, the James Cook and the Discovery. Both are very similar in terms of function, capacity and size. For example, the James Cook is about 90 metres in length and 20 metres wide, and averages about 10 knots in speed. It can also house about 54 people for 50 days. This group of people typically consists of crew, officers and a team of scientists. The type of research expeditions that we run from the NRC effectively go from pole to pole. 
This means that we run research expeditions in the Arctic, the subpolar oceans, subtropical, the tropics, and all the way down to Antarctica. There are many different types of ocean properties that can be measured by research expeditions, but the Ocean Observations Group that Ale and myself are part of usually focus on physical properties such as pressure, temperature, salinity, velocity and biogeochemical properties like oxygen and carbon. Our ships are designed to have as low impact as possible on the environment. The point of this is to minimise as much as possible any damage to the surrounding environment and the ecosystems. So what's it like being at sea? It can be very exhilarating and very intense. The ships normally run on 24 hour schedules and this means science never sleeps. There's always someone on shift either collecting samples on deck or in the lab analysing samples and as in our spare time we might get together to watch movies in the lounge or do some exercises in the gym or even just hang around on the aft deck watching the sunset or the sunrise. The next key component of our ocean observing system are ocean robots. What we mean by this is instruments that operate autonomously. For example, you can give them a program, deploy them in the ocean, and then they will execute that program for as long as they're told to or for as long as they have battery. The two most common ones we use at the NOC are Argo floats and gliders. An Argo float is a cylinder which is a little bit over a meter tall and weighs about 25 kilograms. We typically deploy Argo floats from ships and then they are designed to profile the surface of the ocean to a depth of 2,000 meters. The way they work is that once you deploy them from a ship, they typically dive to about a depth of a thousand meters, they sleep there for about nine days to conserve energy, and then on the tenth day they dive to 2,000 meters and begin an ascent to the surface where they begin to profile. The float measures pressure, salinity, and temperature. Once it gets to the surface, it transmits its data to us via satellite before then diving again and getting its next profile. Almost 4,000 floats are now maintained in the ocean observing system. In recent history, there have been two extensions to the Argo float program. The first is the deep Argo floats. They are designed a little bit differently to the standard Argo floats so that they can withstand pressures of up to 6,000 meters and they have completely revolutionized our understanding of deep ocean circulation. The other extension to the program is the biogeochemical Argo floats, which also measures properties such as oxygen, carbon, and fluorescence. This is important because it is critical for us to understand processes like ocean deoxygenation and acidification. Ocean gliders are a type of robotic underwater vehicle used for measuring oceanographic parameters such as chlorophyll levels, temperature, and salinity, which are then transmitted back to shore via satellite. They are very effective tools for gathering data from the ocean and carry a great variety of instruments. They can be piloted remotely and have the ability to upload their measurements via satellite. They collect data for up to a year and are collected when their mission is complete. Satellites are constantly orbiting the planet and they give us extremely high resolution coverage over the entire surface of the globe. Whereas you can think of the data that we get from ships and from autonomous vehicles as very localized pieces of information, satellites are fantastic in that they give us a survey of the entire global ocean surface. There are many different types of satellites, but the ones that are important to oceanography typically measure the surface wind, sea surface height, sea surface temperature and salinity, and surface velocity. The ROV is a remotely operated vehicle. It is typically deployed from a ship. It descends to the ocean floor where it has two arms that can be used to take ocean floor samples and it also has a large host of cameras that can be used to monitor life on the ocean floor. The ROV that we have at the NOC is one of the only ones in the world and can go to depths of up to 6,500 meters. As carbon dioxide increases, the oceans are becoming more acidic. This impacts ocean species that make hard shells and skeletons, such as corals. As the oceans warm and the glaciers melt, this causes the sea level to rise, and this is currently 3.4 millimetres per year. As the ocean warms, uh, they will hold less oxygen, which will also impact ocean life. As our climate changes, we expect the UK European winters to be stormier, with possible drier, hotter summers. Winter storms will cause local flooding and increased coastal erosion. Our biggest challenge is to reduce our use and dependence on fossil fuels. We can help preserve the seagrasses, mangroves and tidal marshes, which are large sinks of carbon. We can also plant trees and help preserve the peat bogs. 
As individuals, we can use renewables, don't waste energy, don't waste food or water, and also rethink our travel and recycle our waste. Companies can also manufacture goods to last and be easily repairable. This is like a green economy. Methane and carbon capture are needed, but using technology is not the answer on its own. We also need to rethink the way we live. We really hope that this talk both motivates and inspires you to join us in the fight for trying to understand and save our oceans. Thank you very much.